Hi, my name is Miriam Gentle. In this presentation, I will share with you my Doctor of Ministry project and the research behind it. I'll begin with the background of the study and what led to my choice of topic before I go into the details. Thanks for watching. I began my Doctor of Ministry studies in January of 2020. Just a few months later, in March of 2020, I moved to begin a new call at Northwest Church in Richland, Washington. Being new to the congregation and the community, I set a goal to learn the history of the church and the community. When I began my studies, I had no idea what subject I would focus on for my project and thesis. While I was a bit anxious at times that I did not have a project idea, this also freed me up to get creative and gave me time to explore different topics and research methods. But even without a specific topic, there was one goal I had set for myself in my first call as a solo pastor, to be a prophetic voice in the pulpit and in every aspect of my ministry. With that goal in mind and with the backdrop of current events in 2020 front and center, I eventually focused my research on racism in the church, in the congregation and the community. The title of my project is Unforgetting and Lamenting, Engaging a Congregation in Conversations on Racism Using an Arts-Based Methodology. My ministry setting is Northwest Church, a congregation in Richland, Washington, one of the three cities that are collectively known as the Tri-Cities. Northwest Church is part of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ denomination. It is predominantly a white middle-class church that mirrors the racial demographics of the surrounding community. The city of Richland in South Central Washington is predominantly white, a legacy of its origins as a government town. Richland was once a small agricultural village, but this all changed when it was chosen to be part of the Manhattan Project and the new site for the facility that would help create the atomic bomb. If you saw the movie Oppenheimer, you would know a bit about this history. Richland was segregated from its very beginnings. The planners of the Manhattan Project and the town of Richland ensured that minorities never constituted more than 10 to 20 percent of the employees at the Hanford site. As I learned the history of my new home, I became curious about the effects of this embedded racism on the inhabitants and institutions located in Richland. I wanted to understand how Northwest Church, which began and flourished in the early days of World War II, understood the racism embedded in the community. Reading about local history, I learned that on May 18, 1963, peaceful demonstrators protested segregation in Kennewick, Washington, a sundown town adjacent to Richland. Three months after, after this small group of 70 men, women, and children gathered in the Tri-Cities, the march in Washington, D.C. took place. Curious to know what a local church's engagement might have been in 1963 in the Tri-Cities, I turned to the church's archives to see if I could discover some mention of the civil rights movement and specifically the march in Kennewick. What I found was not surprising. Board minutes of the May 1963 meeting showed that the main concern for the church at the moment was the addition of a 30-foot driveway. The detailed discussion on this matter was insufficient for one meeting and a special board meeting was needed for further discussion. I checked the board meeting and minutes reports for June 1963, and in that meeting, the secretary's salary was discussed, the annual church retreat, the father-son banquet, and the need to increase giving. That no mention of any events surrounding the civil rights movement was found was not surprising to me. The history and theological silence on racism was present in the yellowed pages of the church's documents. I had so many questions at this point. Why are so many churches silent on issues of race, racism, and white privilege? How can pastors help their congregation talk about racism? Can the arts help make difficult conversations easier? These questions and my own goal to be a prophetic pastor helped me understand how to move forward with this project.
This project aimed to engage congregations in thoughtful reflection and dialogue on racism and explored the use of local history, personal stories, and the arts as entry points into difficult conversations on race, racism, and identity. The active ministry for this project consisted of four 90-minute sessions held during the summer months of 2023. In each session, participants explored the history of their community, the church, and their personal history to understand race, racism, and identity formation. I created a curriculum for the focus group sessions loosely based on Carolyn Helsold's book, Anxious to Talk About It, Helping White Christians Talk Faithfully About Racism. I adapted the book's chapters and added other resources such as videos, poems, and newspaper articles to focus on local and personal histories and the use of the arts. My research questions were the following. Can learning the history of a congregation's community help begin conversations on racism and white privilege? Can using personal and historical narratives on race and exclusion help congregants change their attitudes on race and help them become more aware of race issues in their community? Can the arts help facilitate difficult conversations on racism and the emotions that arise during those conversations? Can the biblical model of lament contribute to anti-racist work? Northwest is a small membership church with a worshiping average of 35 to 40 people. Therefore, I anticipated the focus group to be small. I personally invited eight church members to participate. Six accepted and two declined because of scheduling conflicts. I also made a general invitation through the church newsletter. Participants covered a wide range of ages and backgrounds. All were members of Northwest Church. The participants included three males and three females. Two participants were between 70 and 80 years old. One was in the 60 to 70 year old range. Two were in their mid 20s and one was in their early 30s. The length of time of membership ranged from 40 years to one year. For decades, segregation in the Tri-Cities was maintained through discriminatory laws that dictated where non-white families could live and not live, where and when they could shop, and what jobs they were allowed to hold. Indigenous communities who had inhabited the land for generations were forced to leave their sacred lands as the government claimed the land for the war effort. How was it possible to displace an entire population of indigenous people? How was it possible that the segregation of black, brown, and Native American people was de facto government policy in the Tri-Cities? In this project, I helped participants understand these and other questions using a post-colonial decolonial studies framework. Post-colonialism is a field of study that focuses on the experience and results of colonization. Post-colonial theory helps uncover the way colonialism is embedded in society's institutions and strives to decenter colonial voices and center marginalized voices. Critics of the term post-colonial point to the prefix and suggest that post is indicative of a time past colonialism, when the reality is that we are living in a nation and a world created by countless colonizing forces. The term decolonial is used as well in academia to acknowledge that reality. The origin story of the United States taught in most schools is a myth. Christopher Columbus, who never set foot on the continental United States, did not discover America. How can land already populated by people be discovered? The doctrine of discovery, a series of 15th century papal bulls allowed European colonizers to acquire title to the land they discovered. After Europeans arrived in the Americas, indigenous populations lost their land and any right to inhabit the only home they knew. In the name of God and to find new income streams, European colonizers claimed ownership of lands and peoples. Centuries after Columbus's discovery of the Americas, 
The arrival of Puritan settlers seeking a land where they could practice their religion freely continued to cement the narrative that land already populated by indigenous people was free for the taking. In my paper, I argued that one of the main driving forces for colonization in the Americas was the belief that Christians were a chosen people with a divine mandate to expand, subdue, and conquer new territories. This origin myth created a colonizing nation that grew by settling on land appropriated through force. The post-colonial decolonial framework helps us understand the origin myth of the United States and its ongoing influence. Indigenous historian and social justice activist Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz writes, origin narratives form the vital core of a people's unifying identity and of the values that guide them. She argues that the true story of the country's early years has been distorted, which has in turn distorted the country's identity, and I argue has distorted our own individual identities. The Columbus myth and the Puritan settlers narrative are the foundation of the United States settler colonial identity. This identity grew in strength and continued to devour any group of people who claimed the land as their own. When we learn about our personal histories and the history of our nation and our community, we can push back on the stock stories taught in schools and faith communities. We can counter the belief that Christians were a chosen people with a divine mandate to expand, subdue, and colonize. We can counter this origin myth and expose the many ways we are who we are as a nation and as a people because of these myths. I like this quote by Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz. She writes, origin narratives form the vital core of a people's unifying identity and of the values that guide them, end quote. This quote helped focus my project on identity formation and racism. The title for this project uses the term unforgetting. I was intrigued by this concept that I found in an interview with Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz. She offers the concept of unforgetting as a tool to counter false origin myths. And the epilogue to her memoir, Outlaw Woman, titled Unforgetting, she champions the importance of learning the true history of the founding of the United States of America as a colonizing force that has manipulated the telling of its history to erase the historical presence of indigenous communities. To unforget is to rethink the origin stories and cast a critical eye on the sources of these stories. Unforgetting is the retelling of the founding history of the United States with the inclusion of all voices. In other words, we must forget the stories that we have been taught and remember and relearn the ones that have been hidden from the history books and theological discussions. How does unforgetting tie in with racism and the local history of Richland and Northwest Church? Dismantling racism in ourselves and in our congregations requires that we learn how racism becomes part of our beliefs and our worldview. A systemic definition of racism posits that racist views are taught, sometimes in obvious and specific ways and sometimes in more subtle ways. These beliefs around race, power, and privilege become part of our worldview. If we can learn racism, can we unlearn it? This is not a simple task. This requires relearning a worldview and rethinking our identity and privilege. Unlearning racism requires an inquiry into why we do what we do and a critical self-evaluation that is disruptive and uncomfortable. This is difficult and emotional work. Another framework I used in my project was intersectionality, a critical social theory. This term was coined in 1989 by Professor Kimberly Crenshaw to describe how race, class, gender, and other individual characteristics intersect with one another and overlap. Using intersectionality can lead to rethinking our sources of knowledge mainly the stories we learned about ourselves and our world. 
Our knowledge and beliefs come from our experiences, upbringing, privilege, and social status, the intersection of race, class, and gender, and other features of our identity. Being aware of the many things that make us who we are can help us better understand our views on race and racism. At the core of this project is the belief that we must know ourselves, the stories of our community and our country, and how our society and culture dictated whose histories were told and privileged to help us learn about racism in ourselves and our congregations and communities. To sum up in this project, I used post-colonial, decolonial studies to help participants understand the hidden histories of our country. The theories used to undergird the historical and epistemological aspects of this project are also used as theological frameworks. Postcolonial theology is the application of postcolonial criticism to Christian theology. Postcolonial theology acknowledges that there is still much work to do to bring silenced voices into theological conversations. The process of decentering both the origin myth of the United States and the theological underpinnings of the settler colonialism project begins with unforgetting history and reclaiming the theological imagination necessary to bring the voices of others to the forefront. In a colonized environment, this requires special attention to the sources of our theology. Along with post-colonial theology, I used intersectional theology to frame my project. Intersectional theology helps widen the scope of our theological views. Intersectional theology asks us to consider whose voices we listen to and learn from. It requires noticing how we re represent God in our sacred spaces. Is Jesus depicted as a white male? Is God an old white man with a beard? Do we use inclusive language in our hymns and liturgies? Reimagining our theologies to allow for more than a white God is part of the decolonizing project. Intersectionality as a framework and theology invites us to place our stories and experiences alongside the stories and experiences of others, creating a collective knowledge about God. In co-creating through an intersectional lens, we engage the voices and experiences of others and begin to imagine what could be. I brought in voices from Mujerista and Womenist theologies to strengthen my theological framework. Working in a Latin American context, theologian Ada Maria Isasi Diaz asserts that the cry of the oppressed demands deep listening and vulnerability on the part of the powerful, an attitude that will lead them to understand how they benefit from oppressive structures, end quote. This is at the core of understanding white privilege. While Mujerista theology focuses mainly on women in Latin America, within that context, it pays attention to the intersection of racism, ethnic prejudice, classism, and sexism. In her book, I Bring the Voices of My People, A Womanist Vision for Racial Reconciliation, Shaniqua Walker Barnes states, white people broadly must undergo a process of rehumanization. They must recover the fullness of their humanity, the Imago Dei, that was lost through cooperating with the powers, end quote. Both Mujerista and Womenist theologies are focused on seeking justice. I used these theologians as conversation partners to frame my project as a justice-seeking project that went beyond theory. Another theological framework I used in this project was the biblical lament as found in the Psalms. Approximately one-third of the Psalms in the Bible are either communal or individual Psalms of lament. While the inclusion of the Psalms in worship varies by denomination, many biblical scholars speak to the need for the lament Psalms to help the church articulate the suffering and struggle experienced by so many. The emotional language of lament can only come from a place of deep suffering that few people want to experience. Yet the reality is that so many people have felt like the psalmist, forsaken and forgotten. The lament acknowledges this deep grief and pain. The poetry of the Lament Psalms allows one to enter the experience of forsakenness, even if you have never experienced it. When we unforget and lament the history of the United States and the history of our communities, founded in the pain and grief of the forsaken and forgotten, we can begin to move from theory to praxis and awareness to action.
When we notice the past wrapped in a collective lament, we also lament the present and the multiple oppressions still experienced by many. I used an arts-based method to research and interpret the data collected in this project. Arts-based research draws on all forms of art practices, writing, music, film, dance, and other forms of artistic expression. These art practices become the tools that researchers use for interpretation of data. For this project, I use Poetic Inquiry, a participatory arts-based research methodology. Discussing race, racism, and privilege and identity is difficult and emotional work. In this project, I argued that using an arts-based research method helps soften some difficult emotional work. Arts-based research has the potential to help people to see or think differently and to learn something new. My goal in using an arts-based methodology was to find creative and innovative ways to lead the church through this uncomfortable conversation. By using poetic inquiry, I worked collaboratively with the participants who became co-authors with me. I centered their voices in the research and placed myself next to them as leader, learner, and participant. You may ask, what qualifies me to use poetry as a methodology? And this is a valid question. I do not claim to be a poet. I have never published any poems. My experience with poetry is limited to a few writing classes and my own curiosity and the study of poems written by real poets to guide my learning. I created a, a curriculum incorporating poetry from different communities to introduce that session's topic. For example, for the session highlighting segregation and the embedded racism in this community's history, I introduced a session with a poem by Amanda Gorman, an African-American writer, written for President Biden's inauguration. For the session introducing the doctrine of discovery and the forced move of local tribes for the Manhattan Project, I began with a poem by Joe Harjo, a native poet. I used videos whenever possible and allowed time for writing, but the richest part of the sessions was the free discussion. I recorded and transcribed each session and used these discussions in my research. The project was an intersectional dialogue between the arts, theology, personal stories, local history, racism, and privilege. One focus of this study was the participants' experiences as they learned about white privilege and race and processed their own emotions through the written word. Through this project, I encouraged and engaged people in dialogue to expand their understanding of identity and culture so that the knowledge of people and places that were once unknown could be known. Through two forms of poetic inquiry, found and generated poetry, I interpreted the data and offered my understandings of the experiences shared by the project participants. Found poetry is a rearrangement of words and phrases and sometimes whole passages taken from research and reframed as poetry. Generated poetry is when the researcher uses their own words to describe and interpret anything discovered in research. In the project sessions curriculum, I included prompts and templates to help participants create their own pro poems to help process what they learned. I allowed time during the sessions for some of the writing as well as assigning writing between sessions. The data collected for this project included participants' personal written and verbal narratives, written responses to weekly prompts, poetry written by the participants in response to weekly session learnings, and transcripts from the group sessions and exit interviews. The use of journaling and poetry writing to process the information received mixed reviews. This was not a surprising result. Not everyone processes information in the same way. Some need to talk it out, some need to write it out. Poetry is still considered a high form of literature by many and can be difficult to understand. While writing poetry can be a powerful tool to distill experiences, emotions, and concepts to their most basic, it can be daunting. I anticipated that reality that some participants would struggle with creating poetry, so I offered templates and several prompts for each session's assignments. I read the data interpretively, looking for implied or inferred meanings in the transcripts. I also read the data reflexively, mindful of my own comments and reactions. I acknowledge that as a researcher, I bring my own lens to this work. 
My biases and my own experience as a person of color and a child of immigrants impacted the research. I analyzed the data through inductive coding, which allows for themes to emerge rather than bringing preconceived themes to the research. After the active ministry was concluded, I gathered all the materials and read through everything. I highlighted recurring phrases and words. Each research question generated several themes. For example, the first research question asked, can learning the history of a congregation's community help begin conversations on racism and white privilege? This question focused on the importance of an awareness of one's own personal identity formation within a community of origin and an awareness of the history of racism in their community and in the nation as a possible first step into a broader conversation on race and racism. One of the themes that emerged from the data was an increased awareness of identity formation and their embedded racism. I highlighted this theme by creating two poems using the participants' words collected from journals, discussions, and exit interviews. I did this for each of the research questions. The first poem, which I'll share in the next slide, is based on a participant's recollection of learning about Christopher Columbus as a child and learning about the doctrine of discovery during a focus group session as an older adult. The participant likened identity formation to cooking and explained that we know what we know, and that is like the soup we are cooked in. But one's attitude can shift if we change the temperature and throw another vegetable in. The participants' words and creative images were a gift that I incorporated into a pantoum poem. A pantoum poem uses a repetition, repetition of lines, and the repetition includes from the beginning to the end. You will see in the next slide. The second poem in another slide tells of a participant's earliest memories of race and the lack of representation in the media. This participant identifies as indigenous and non-white. The poem addresses the awakening of racial identity in young children and questions why whiteness is normative. A recipe for change. As a child, we just absorbed the stories, no questions asked. The truths we were taught in school. This was a soup that you were cooked in. No questions asked, like Columbus, the past is what it is. This is a soup that you were cooked in, what you were raised in, what you end up being. Like Columbus, the past is what it is. Can we ignore it? Can we change what you were raised in, what you are now? Change the temperature, throw another vegetable in. Can we ignore it? Can we change, live longer, travel, have new experiences, change the temperature, throw another vegetable in? Then the paradigm can shift. Openness can happen. Live longer, travel, have new experiences. You are no longer a child, just absorbing stories. Paradigms shift. A path opens. The truths are learned in living. Star Wars So White or Representation Matters. I remember my neighborhood, white, not like me. We loved all things Star Wars, my white friend and me. Who would we dress up as this Halloween? Luke Skywalker. My friend said, who will you be? I said, I don't know. Who looks like me? And then we just sat thinking so quietly. My white friend and me. This poem using the participants' own words is a perfect example of how even young children start to understand that white is normative and they question it but are not sure how to deal with it and they struggle. I added my own title, Representation Matters, because that was the case for me as a child. Who looked like me when I watched TV or movies?
In this project, I analyze the effectiveness of the arts as a tool for discussing racism. Using the participants' voices, I found that while poetry and journaling are not for everyone, some participants found connecting to their inner poet was a productive way to process their thoughts. I offer two examples using the participants' words. The first poem shows that poetry and journaling are not for everyone. I gathered those thoughts into a lighthearted poem to highlight the struggle. On resistance to poetry and journaling, make me think, make me feel, just don't make me write it down. It's so vulnerable, it's so silly. Bear your soul, just write it down. While some participants struggled with the written word, others found a way to connect with their inner poet. Again, using the participants' words found in transcripts and journals, here's an example of how writing helps process thoughts and emotions. A thoughtful trip back. Writing, it took me back to my younger years. I'm a completely different person now. In high school, my friends were all white. In college, I had friends who were people of color. Writing. It took me back to the beginning of my evolution, understanding implicit bias, understanding my privilege. It took me a long time to accept I have privilege that not everyone has. Writing, it took me back. The following themes emerged after analyzing the data related to research question number four. Can the biblical model of lament contribute to anti-racist work? This was the focus of the final session. In this session, I introduced the identity statement of the Christian Church, Disciples of Christ, focusing on the phrase, a movement for wholeness in a fragmented world. I then introduced the idea of using spiritual practices, particularly lamenting, to acknowledge our fragmented world and to begin creating an anti-racist identity. I based this final session on the Health Cell book and an article from The Christian Century on using the Psalms of Lament in anti-racism work. This session on lamenting offered many interesting paths for discussion. After discussing the lament form, I explained that the biblical lament psalms were examples of complaining in faith that usually ended with words of trust. Older participants did not fully understand why we should lament as it seemed to be a form of whining or complaining, which was discouraged in their upbringing. One younger participant discussed TikTok as a venue for complaining about life and offered that these complaints can be seen as a way of lamenting. Another participant offered that lamenting is a way to bring attention to injustice in our lives and in our world. In response to this insight, we had a rich discussion on the Black Lives Matter movement and how we might begin to see protests as a form of lament. I challenged the participants to write their own laments. And here is a thoughtful example from one of the younger participants lamenting racial injustice in the past and specifically in their own past. Lament to the universe. Time is a thief. Time took my childlike faith in the American dream. Time took the names of my forebearers. Time took my right to seek justice. Time brings change, but it cannot change. A miracle is to reverse time, to change whatever changed. Time is measured by amount of change, amount of sand in an hourglass, amount of healthy cells left. Time cannot stop, so change cannot stop. We must choose to walk a different path for those who will follow in our footsteps. After time has erased us from this universe, let time take the pain meant for the future to store it safely in our past. Here is an example of a multi-voice lament using the participants' words from our discussion on lament. Notice how the different voices wrestle with lamenting as a part of the discussion on racism. 
They voice their ambivalence and discouragement and acknowledge their own complicity. Ultimately, they admit that change must happen, but only if they act. Voice one, I wrestle with lamenting. It seems like whining. Voice two, microscale. I grew up in a strict household. Don't complain. Don't talk about your feelings. Macro scale. In this country, we don't talk through things. We suppress it. We push it down. Voice three. I was raised a good Christian in a do it right kind of family. Complaining was not the Christian thing to do. How does this make me feel? Discouraged. Discouraged. Voice one. Black Lives Matter was a giant slap in the forehead. As a white person, my gut reaction was all lives matter. But that wasn't what black people were saying. They were saying our lives matter. I don't think things will change until white people see stepping forward is our responsibility. Voice two. Some Christians say we shouldn't even listen to them. They call the homeless lazy freeloaders. We shouldn't let them voice their needs, they say. We shouldn't give them the time of day, they say. Do I have a solution? No, but it's nice to hear that we're even talking about it. Unison. How do you give voice to the voiceless? Listen to their complaints. Receive their lament. Talk about it. Do something. One obvious limitation of this Act of Ministry project was the study's sample size. Six participants are not enough to offer decisive theoretical insights or generalize my research findings. Another limitation of this project was the pastor-congregant relationship that preceded this study. This prior relationship can help participants feel at ease. It can also be seen as a limitation if the participants feel they cannot offer honest feedback or comments. I addressed the last point in several ways, through verbal acknowledgement in the final exit interview and during the focus group sessions. What difference did this study make? After the project, I found that participants were more open and willing to discuss difficult topics. The project fostered a sense of community among the participants of the study. On a personal level, this project helped me own my expertise and a lifetime of experience in intercultural relations. I've asked myself, what would I do differently if I were to repeat the project? Knowing that ministry is contextual, I would adapt the curriculum to fit the context as necessary. This project can be replicated in almost any setting because racism knows no boundaries. Developments since the final project include, last year I became the chair of the Northern Lights region of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ Anti-Racism Pro-Reconciliation Team, and I have presented my doctoral studies to several local groups. What is the outcome that I wanted to see from this project? First, I hope that this project will begin a conversation on race and racism to empower others to work for racial justice. Second, I set a goal to help the participants understand how they are racialized and where their beliefs and thoughts on race and racism stem from. Finally, my goal was to engage my prophetic voice as a pastor and congregational leader and encourage others to do likewise. I achieved these goals and even more with this project. I want to thank all my professors and my advisor, Dr. Lisa Barnett, for their guidance, wisdom, and encouragement. I want to especially thank the members of Northwest Church and the participants of this project who entrusted me with their words and their thoughts. Thank you.